This is Max, a 14 year old from California and Max built that 3D printer right there. And then he sent it to me. There you are, welcome back. This is the famed Wizard 3D W1 that a 14 year old kid in California sent to me. And it's been a whirlwind of fun playing with this machine, fixing some of the things that shipping broke and just being a mentor to this kid who has an incredibly bright future ahead of him. There are six questions that I'm gonna answer during this video and I've got them right here on my laptop. What is it? Where did it come from? How did it get here? Does it print well? Is there anything I would change? And what does the future look like for Wizard 3D? What is it? This is a 3D printer. It is very Voron-esque. It looks like a Voron, and that's because the motion components and the head are Voron, but Max designed this part up here and the power supply holder and the electronics case, and I believe the mounts for the Z motors as well. And uh, according to Voron licensing, as long as things are released in the right way, um, this, is, this is okay. I don't know for sure because I am not a legal expert, but uh, those in the Voron community, uh, I believe it's okay, correct me if I'm wrong. It's got a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, it's running an E3D hot end, and it's 310 on the X, 310 on the Y, and 390 on the Z or Z. It could print crazy fast because it's Core XY, but also because it's running Clipper with mainsail 2.0 beta, which is using Moonraker. Get ready for some serious moon action. It's got a big tree tech board in there, a Raspberry Pi and uh, TMC 2209s. So movements are really not that loud, but incredibly fast. Part of what Clipper allows you to do is run something called Input Shaper. And that's where it moves the head on X and Y at various uh, frequencies of movement cycles. I think that's what it is. And then there is an accelerometer on the head that records the motion and then it reads it and it allows you to put that within the software. So when it's doing fast movements, it knows how to accelerate and decelerate without ghosting. It's incredible. And I didn't quite perfect it, but this is my first experience with it and it was really fun to play with. Where did this come from? It's an interesting story. Uh, I get a lot of email you've got mail. And one of the emails that I got, I'm very thankful I read, it was from Max Liebman, a 14 year old in California, who said he had a passion for building 3D printers and his dream was to start a 3D printer company. He's calling it Wizard 3D, which is a fine name and the printer's called a W1, which maybe we can workshop that. That's fine, Max, I'm just giving you crap, I'm sorry. The idea was he wanted to build a 3D printer and send it to me to get out on a live stream and I thought, well, that's really cool. And I'm totally up for this, especially after sending me the specs. I did have some reservations though, because in a live stream, it's like skydiving and not knowing if you have a parachute on board or just fingers crossed you do. Is he wearing a parachute? No. I wanted to give Max an opportunity to showcase his 3D printer and the best side of it, and a live stream might not be the case. And so I recommended to him that we do this in a dedicated video sort of way, which is what you're watching right now. How did it get here? Max and his family packaged this machine into a box and sent it to me. They wrapped up the frame in bubble wrap. The box arrived where I get my, my mail and I snapped a photo uh, as it was in the back of my wife's van and I posted it to Twitter and a lot of people were really excited about that. I got it home, I got this out of the box and the first thing that happened was these uh, TPU feet. These were on the bottom and they were super glued to the PLA. Now I know just from experience, super glue isn't gonna hold TPU to PLA very well. When I told Max about this, he sent a picture of a new foot design that utilized holes in the TPU and screws going into the extrusion to hold them into place. Brilliant. He did include a spool of filament, which I didn't use. It's a tiny spool, but that's okay. He also included Jelly Belly jelly beans, which I gave to Sean. How were they? Delicious. Jelly Belly filament? Are you kidding me? 
The candy and the filament arrived fine, but the problem is we can't expect a 14 year old to be a shipping engineer. And so most of the printer made it, but there were some issues. The electronics box separated and kind of broke away from the extrusion as did the mount for the touch screen and one of the heated bed brackets, there we go, one of these, one of the heated bed brackets broke in transit as well. So I had him send me the STLs and I reprinted them and that's what's on the machine right now. Uh, the electronics case and the, uh, the bed mount is an IC 3D ABS on the Raze 3D E2 and this up front, I reprinted that in my Hi-Fi Blue on the Flash Forge Creator 3. One thing I did notice though, is the print quality on these parts that Max did, it's not the best. And I know this is something that Max can work on, but just as an example, uh, they crumbled in my hands. It looks like he printed in one color and then painted them blue, which I'm for because blue is awesome. But for some reason, they just don't, they're, they're very soft and uh, they crumble in my hand. And I don't think that packaging necessarily like I, I firmly believe the shipper probably treated this a little harder than they should, but at the same time, I think that uh, print quality of the parts probably contributed to some of the problems that we had. But again, Max is 14. He's learning about this stuff. I get it and reprinting in my case, totally fine. Other problems that I ran into, uh, I just, uh, the, the Z brackets themselves, they held up. But if you look right there, at one point in printing, the motors fell through and that's because the screws pulled through and that's what you see, this plastic kind of giving away right here. So the brackets that you see on the machine are actually printed on the Raze 3D E2 in that IC 3D ABS. The motion components themselves have held up and the head has held up, but if you take a look, they do suffer from that similar print quality issues. I don't wanna reprint everything on this machine. We have to evaluate what Max sent and so uh, I've limited to what I reprinted just to, to what I told you about. Does it print well? That is a firm yes. So again, this isn't a machine that you or anyone else is probably going to see. This is a single machine that a kid built and sent to me, but the print quality is pretty fantastic. Uh, I did a lot of prints. The thing on the bed is a, um, a candy corn with legs. Don't judge me. And I think it, it turned out great. Uh, the legs move. I was able to print this Starro from Chelsea over at Chaos Cortec. And honestly, that looks pretty dang good. This is in Filament One PLA. I should have printed it larger. I always say that. I did wanna find out if this head, which is a Voron head, has the airflow proper enough to be able to do a lot of stringing and bridging. Well, take a look at that. Hi, Sean. <laughs> I thought this turned out great. In fact, I posted this to social media and people loved it and I thought, Let's, let's throw it a test. And so what I did is I took this and I stacked it six high in the slicer and I hit print. And sure enough, it worked. So I don't know what to do with this, but uh, I really like it. I did, uh, I printed myself a mini Joel, of course, but mini Joel was murdered on the bed. I'd like to report a murder. And that, uh, that leads me to the, the bed adhesion on that, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. Uh, chain links, I, I printed these in place and then they came off. Those are good. I printed a, uh, an oversized chip clip. Feed me! I believe this is a Sir, Serpinski's uh, triangle, right? It's a, it is a single extrusion line, just over and over and over again. And uh, it's not perfect. The problem with this is that I think it over extruded a little bit. But again, I think the printer has the capability to print extremely well. This is from, uh, oh man, a, 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 a it's like A-G-E-P-B-I-Z at GetBiz. Uh, it's, his name is like Stian, S-T-I-A-N. This is his, um, uh, his calibration cube. I printed it a little larger. This is in protopasta filaments. It's the Amy Double D blood of my enemies. It's fantastic. But right off the build plate, everything worked just fine. Uh, the print, I don't think it's perfect, but it looks really, really good. I enjoy how this looks. Now, this is a Voron or Voron inspired machine and it's got input shaping and clipper, which means we attempt a speedboat race, right? And I, I gave it a little bit because I know you, there is a massively deep rabbit hole you can dive down if you're doing a speedboat race. And I don't think anybody's really gonna beat Vez 3D and his Benchy in three minutes and 39 seconds, which just 
blows my mind, but these were speed benchies and eventually I got it down to 21, 22 minutes, which I believe is that one right there. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. 22 minutes, 41 seconds, 40 seconds. Okay, okay. Obviously I could adjust accelerations and really refine my input shaper and turn off retractions and just full send and turn up the temperature. Uh, you know, I could dive down there, uh, but I didn't want to. I think 22 minutes for a Benchy that looks like that is darn fine. And uh, if you don't think so, I will fight you. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. One of the things though, I should talk about this. Um, you can see some ringing here. I don't think I had my input shaper properly set. Again, I'm still learning, but if I keep this machine and I do some more tuning on it, we'll try to get it so I could do this really fast without the ringing. I wanna give a huge shout out to two people real quick, uh, Nero 3D. Uh, he is my, my clipper muse and a wonderful human. He helped me with a lot of this because some of the issues that we ran into were configuration based. As an example, this stepper motor for the extruder was running at one amp, which caused it to heat up enough to transfer heat into here and cause a jam. I talked to him over Twitter DM and it was, it was great because he understood the problem. He gave me some things to, to check and we took the amperage down, I believe, to 0.7 amp. It still gets warm, but it's not hot and it doesn't transfer the heat and we're all good there. The other person I wanna give a shout out to is Brett. When I replaced the, uh, the electronics enclosure, I took a ton of photos, tons of photos. I did that so that I could make sure all of the wires and all the plugs went back in the right spot. And in doing that, I discovered that because this broke off, one of the wires for the auto leveling probe uh, broke out of the JST connector. And I didn't have a JST connector set or crimper at the house. My buddy Brett did, and uh, he didn't live too far away. So I met him at the coffee shop, him and his lovely pupper, and I got the crimp set from him. And it was, it was awesome. And that's what let me fix this. And actually, while I'm on the topic, when I was replacing everything in the electronics box, putting it back together, I noticed that some of the wires were loose in the crimped connectors on the power supply, and I didn't really like that. So I had those <laughs> at home in my garage, and I was able to recrimp all of those, and they're now nice and tight. Is there anything I would change about this? What I would change first is the way the machine is packaged, and rather than uh, bubble wrap around all the extrusions. I would utilize custom cutout foam. I think that's gonna be the key to getting these things safely to customers. One of the other things I would change is the build surface. Right now, it's using a BQ flexible build plate. I didn't have the best luck with adhesion on that. And so what I did is I swapped in a flexible plate with PEI that I use on my Daedalus from Project R3D. And that seemed to work a lot better. I'm not saying the BQ sheet is bad, I'm just saying I didn't have a lot of luck with it. If you look at the extrusions on the machine, there are an awful lot of corner brackets, like an awful lot. And it really, it really doesn't lend itself to putting things together in an easy way to make the frame square. In fact, back here, I can tell that it's just a few millimeters low and up top, it's a few millimeters high. If production were to happen, and Max, I'm, I'm speaking to you, rather than using a whole bunch of corner brackets, what I would do is screw into the extrusions. You can tap and drill the holes and use long screws to hold the extrusions in, and that will guarantee you a, the closest to 90 degrees that you're probably going to get, and it's gonna sturdy up that frame without having to worry about corner brackets and making right angles out of things. There's nothing wrong with the way this was done, but there's a lot more attachments that are keeping this machine together. And if you're shipping it fully assembled, that means there's that many more attachments that need to be checked by your customer in order to verify that the machine is square. Uh, next, I would print better parts. Max, I, I know you're 14, but I really have to kind of knock you on this a little bit, just because the printed parts that you gave me, like I, I have in this pile here, they weren't of the best quality. And one thing you can consider, uh, there's a lot of people and print houses that will do orders of custom parts. In fact, my buddy Pooch over at Repcord has a 3D printing farm of Prusa's and Creality CR30s that could spit out a bunch of parts for you. He's actually in California. I don't know, maybe he's your neighbor. But what you could do is reach out to him and have 
a set of W1 parts that you send to him. And when you get a customer order, you could say, hey, Pooch, print me a set of parts. Or you could wait and have five or 10 parts sets printed ahead of time that you would then take into your house and build the machines and ship them out. I don't know, those are logistics that, that you could work out. Finally, finally, there's no power switch. Obviously, this is, this is not the worst thing in the world to knock someone on. You can use a power strip with a switch on it if you need to switch the machine off and on, but there is no power switch. And I did have to find myself reaching behind the machine and down to the power outlet to plug it in and out a couple times it, within the time that I've owned it. I think that putting a power switch on the machine is just, it's that, it's that little bit further touch of quality. Because you're offering essentially a premium product and you want to provide that premium experience. And one of the ways to do that is to put a power switch on it. What does the future look like for Wizard 3D W1? That is an amazing question. And I think that what, with what I've seen from Max, I think he's in a good spot. So Max at 14 is still, he's in high school. Uh, he's got homework. He's got high school things to worry about. How do you do fellow kids? What? But at the same time, he's building machines and he wants to start a company and he wants to be able to hire people. In an email exchange, uh, part of the reason why I went from a live stream to a dedicated video is because if something went wrong in the live stream, it could kill it. But if something went right and he got a bunch of attention right away, he might not be prepared for that. I said, would you be prepared for that much attention thrown your way? He said, you know, no, but here's what I could do. I could build a website and build in uh, a payment portal for people to be able to make pre-orders. And then what I could do is make a PDF of an install guide for my family and friends to follow and they can help me build the machines and, and they can do that until I'm able to hire people to then build the machines. So at 14, he's already way ahead of the game in, in preparing for his company to be able to make these. And obviously at this point, he can't offer hundreds, but I would imagine Max could probably take a pre-order of a few, maybe five, maybe 10, source the parts, get them built, send them to customers, and then get the feedback. Uh, that's probably the next step. I don't know for sure because Max has homework. And so I don't know what sort of time he has right now to dedicate to this endeavor. But I do know Max is smart. His parents are very supportive and he's got, he's got a really good additive manufacturing future ahead of him. You know, uh, Sean, David, and I, we were just at Rapid TCT, an industrial additive manufacturing show. And I moderated a panel talking to industry experts about how we attract more young people into the additive manufacturing industry, not just consumer-based 3D printing, but the industrial side where these million dollar machines are making parts for billion dollar companies. And part of it was finding kids who are inspired to get into this and then supporting them. This is what we're doing with Max, that 14 year old wonder kid in California. This isn't Max's last stop. And if, and if Wizard 3D is successful, you know that's not gonna be his last endeavor in 3D printing. And there's a really, really good chance that Max is either going to take over the world or be an incredibly industrious, fantastic, inspired worker in the additive manufacturing industry for decades to come. So at this point, this isn't something you can buy. In fact, if you go to the wizard3dofficial.com website, there isn't really any place to put money in or to purchase or to pre-order. Uh, it's very limited in what's being offered. But again, he's 14, he's gotta finish his homework. He's got a lot of stuff ahead of him. So Max, if I could recommend anything to you, I would, I would recommend making sure that you get everything you need to get done as a 14 year old, but then setting goals for your company with timetables. Because if you have a month to do something and you, you have an idea of your homework over that time, you can easily piecemeal things together to get your goal done. So do that. And I think as an industry, if we have other companies with ideas that can reach out to you and perhaps lend a hand, make this happen easier, perhaps give you some shipping help, uh, I, I hope they do. Just outfit your website a little bit better with ways where people can get more information and perhaps send you a tip. So at this point, Max, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds or so and I'd like to hand it to you. Tell people why they should be interested in you and Wizard 3D. Around maybe April or May of 2021, I decided to start the Wizard 3D W1 project. Now this is 
a brand new piece of technology. I use the Voron motion system platform. It's extremely reliable, it's extremely fast, and it's also extremely quiet. Uh, combined with more powerful stepper motors and a more powerful control box, this thing can take on pretty much any task. I've thrown at it so far over the summer. And I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see how all this will work. Well, if you've made it this far, quite honestly, you're awesome. I, I'm so thankful I got the opportunity to show you this machine and tell you the story of Max Liebman, the 14 year old in California that built it and sent it to me. And the, the kid that has some pretty amazing goals in mind. I really don't think this is the last we're gonna hear from him. And I'm gonna do everything I can to help empower Max and others like him to find success within additive manufacturing. And I hope you do as well. Don't forget to help each other more. Fight for a cause you believe in. And as always, high five.